four and a half thousand years ago. Northern Europe is slowly emerging from the Stone Age. In the Mediterranean, the roots of two great civilizations, Greece and Rome, have yet to take hold. In Mesopotamia, the mighty empire of Assyria is still far in the future. But to the south, on the northeast tip of Africa, something unparalleled in antiquity is taking place. Rising from the banks of the Nile River in Egypt are three colossal pyramids, monuments to the most enduring civilization the world would ever see. When the Greek historian Herodotus visited Egypt four and a half centuries before the birth of Christ, he was awestruck. The wonders were greater than those of any other land, he observed. There were pyramids taller than any man-made structures on earth. Avenues of sphinxes, half man, half beast. And towering stone pillars called obelisks. There were giant statues of long dead pharaohs. And exotic mummies encased in gold. And everywhere, the enigmatic symbols of its sacred writing. Here, reaching across the chasm of time, was a civilization that had flourished for more than 3,000 years. To the ancients, Egypt was already ancient. Cleopatra, who ruled during the first century BC, is closer in time to us than she is to the pharaohs who built the pyramids. Egypt is so old that for centuries its origins remained shrouded in mystery. Even the Egyptians weren't really sure how old they were or where they came from. Herodotus said Egypt was the gift of the Nile. But the Egyptians knew from the beginning that life on the Nile could be precarious. Isolated by an endless expanse of desert, vulnerable to a river that was unpredictable, and a climate that could dramatically change, civilization in Egypt was forged in part by the realities of a harsh environment. The Egyptians called it chaos. Lurking in the background were powerful forces waiting to be unleashed.
because disaster could strike at any moment, the Egyptians clung to a profound belief. Order, not chaos, was the will of the gods. To maintain order and keep chaos at bay, the Egyptians envisioned a king who was a living god, the earthly manifestation of Horus the Hawk, ruler of the skies. Pitted against him was the unruly god Seth, the harbinger of chaos. The eternal conflict between order and chaos would ultimately guide the destiny of Egyptian civilization. But the true story of how it came about vanished in antiquity. In the twilight of Egypt's greatness, around 300 BC, a priest named Manetho began the awesome task of compiling the first complete history of Egypt. The challenge would have been daunting, yet in temple libraries and on the walls of Egypt's most sacred places, volumes had already been written. A thousand years before Manetha was born, the pharaoh Seti I built a temple at Abydos dedicated to Osiris, the god of the dead. In a special hall of the ancestors, his son, the future Ramesses II, is shown reading from a papyrus. The document, carved on the wall in hieroglyphs, contains a list of 76 royal names in chronological order. Each name is encircled by a stylized coil of rope. The symbol called by Egyptologists a cartouche identifies a king. Together the kings ruled over 2,000 years of Egyptian history. Using temple documents such as these, Manetho organized his history into 30 royal dynasties. The earliest name on the list is Mene. King Mene founded Egypt's first dynasty about 3100 BC. According to Manetho, he reigned for 60 years during which he expanded Egypt's borders and won great acclaim before being carried off by a hippopotamus. Before King Mene, Egypt was ruled by demigods called the Spirits of the Dead, but their names were long forgotten. Were the Spirits of the Dead history or mythology? Where did Egyptian civilization really begin? Ironically, not along the banks of the Nile. Seventy miles west of the Nile in the Sahara Desert, it's so hot and dry, what little rain that falls evaporates before it hits the ground. Here in this desolate landscape lived a tribe of nomads who just may have been the ancestors of the pharaohs.
Fred Wendorf of Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, heads an international team of archaeologists who've been scouring the desert looking for signs of human occupation. In 1974, they located an ancient settlement on the rim of a shallow basin they call Napta Playa. The Sahara was not always parched and arid. Radiocarbon dating reveals that at about 8000 BC, tropical Africa's summer monsoon shifted northward, increasing the rainfall on the desert and allowing seasonal lakes to form. One such lake was Napta Playa. Here, surrounded by stretches of grassland to feed their livestock, people could take shelter from the heat and the vagaries of the desert. But the rain was unpredictable. Without it, the lake dried up. Three days without water meant the difference between life and death. With survival hanging in the balance, a remarkable thing happened. Co-leader of the expedition, Rumol Schild of the Polish Academy of Sciences, has discovered a tiny circle of stones, a Stonehenge in miniature, but 2,000 years older. He thinks it was used to predict the coming of the rainy season. Well, this humble pile of rocks that you see here is actually one of the oldest calendars ever found. This one consisted of a stone ring and two stone, upright stone alignments that I call gates. You can see them here and there. And one of the alignments points to the north, exactly. The other one, though, that you can see in this, going in this direction, points to the position of the sun on the 21st of June. That is the beginning of summer the beginning of the rain season in this belt of Africa. The discovery of this calendar circle only hinted at what was to come. Nearby, several unusual stones were also found, arranged in circles marking the location of deep pits. The stones, some weighing over one and a half tons, didn't come from Napta Playa. They'd been dragged here from a distant quarry. For the desert dwellers to transport large stones and erect them required an incredible amount of effort and organization. The question is, why? Fred Wendorf thinks they may mark the graves of important people or honor their spirits. Perhaps someone powerful enough to intercede with the gods and bring rain. One of the most imposing objects was found in this pit, perhaps the final resting place of a ruler or a chieftain. At first it looked like an ordinary boulder, but when Wendorf examined it more closely, it turned out to be a primitive sculpture. We found this very large and carefully shaped stone down in this hole, about a meter above the uh, large bedrock outcrop here that's shaped like a mushroom. You can see how carefully it's worked, and smoothed on the surfaces, sharp edge, and you can see how they were able to control the uh, length of the piece by uh, 
making grooves in this face here, which you can see. And then by using a wedge, they were able to uh, strike off the flakes at exactly the points that they wanted to. This is altogether a very impressive piece of, of uh, stonework, and it may well have marked the beginning of Egyptian fascination with working in large stones. It is also an important marker of social rank because the ability to control large numbers of men that were needed to shape this stone, to bring it into position, to shape the bedrock below, uh, required that there would be numerous people for a considerable period of time to accomplish all of this. And this indicates that this individual had a higher rank than the others. Here, 7,000 years ago, the first crude monuments in Egypt rose from the desert to honor a fallen king and bring order out of chaos. But for the people of Naptiplaya, the sands of time were running out. Around 5000 BC, the summer monsoon began to shift again, this time south. The rains eventually stopped and oases like Naptiplaya permanently dried up. Forced to abandon the desert, the settlers headed due east, towards the Nile. Egypt's lifeblood. From origins deep in East Africa, the river flows northward some 4,000 miles before reaching Egypt's Nile Valley, an oasis over 600 miles long. For the last 100 miles, it fans out into a wide delta before spilling into the Mediterranean Sea. Throughout Egyptian history, the Nile was both a blessing and a curse. Once a year, swollen by monsoon rains in Ethiopia, the river flooded its banks, depositing nutrient-rich soil Egyptians called the Black Land. Without it, Egypt would be barren. With it, one of the most fertile regions on Earth. But in the past, the river was as unpredictable as rain in the desert. Too high a flood could destroy villages. Too low a flood meant famine. To escape the chaos of uncertainty, the Egyptians devised the world's first calendar based on three seasons of four months each. It's the model for the calendar we use today. But this time, they weren't watching the weather, they were watching the Nile. The time of the flood was called inundation. The time of emergence was when the water receded and crops could be planted. During the dry period, when the Nile was lowest, the crops were harvested.
Working together, the Egyptians dug wells, built dikes to protect their villages, and developed the rudiments of geometry to redraw their property lines each year. By 4000 BC, after the people of Napta Playa had settled in the Nile Valley, the first glimmerings of Egyptian civilization began to appear. Beautifully decorated pottery, animal shaped palettes designed for mixing cosmetics. flint knives so well made they've never been equaled, some with elaborately carved ivory handles. Gradually, between 4000 and 3000 BC, two powerful kingdoms emerged. Because the Nile flows from south to north, the kingdom that flourished in the Nile Delta is called Lower Egypt the land of the papyrus plant. The kingdom of Upper Egypt, the land of the lotus, blossomed in the Nile Valley. The symbols of the two kingdoms are woven together throughout Egyptian history. They signify the union of the two lands into the world's first great civilization. What has long puzzled archaeologists is how and when unification took place. Renee Friedman of the University of California at Berkeley and her colleagues are looking for clues at the site of the ancient capital of Upper Egypt. What you got over there, Sean? Uh, we got what appears to be a man. Called by the Greeks, Hierakonpolis, the city of the hawk. It was Egypt's first city. About 35 to 50 year range. Today, its monuments and structures are long gone. Instead, craters dug by robbers litter the site. A century ago, archaeologists thought that all that was left of the desert was a plundered cemetery not worth exploring. Little did they know that hidden in the sand was a wealth of new information. New discoveries show that by 3500 BC, Hierakonpolis was one of the most important settlements along the Nile. Over two miles long, it was a bustling community of farmers, administrators, craftsmen, and potters. One potter was manufacturing cookware for his neighbors. He signed his pots by pressing his thumb into the wet clay just below the rim. 5,000 years later, fragments still cover the ground near his kiln. Because of a freak industrial accident, it is possible to identify his home. These are the remains of the potter's house. It's the oldest preserved house in all of Egypt, and we owe its fine preservation to the fact that the potter worked a little bit too close to where he lived. Fortunately for us, but unfortunately for him, one day a shift in the wind caused the fire from the kiln to travel the short distance to the house setting it alight. The fire reddened and hardened the native silt and the mud bricks that formed the lower portion of the house and reduced the posts and the mats of its walls to the charcoal and ash that we see here. Mm -hmm. 
On the north side of town was a vast industrial complex of bakeries, Egypt's earliest known breweries, and granaries for storing wheat. But the most important structure in Hierakonpolis was uncovered in 1985 when archaeologists stumbled upon several large holes six feet deep, large enough to support massive wooden columns 20 feet tall. These columns formed the facade of a massive shrine that would have dominated the entire temple complex and the town of Hierakonpolis as a whole. This is the earliest known temple in Egypt. Nowhere was the power of the king more evident. During ritual ceremonies, the king, seated on a throne, would oversee the sacrifice of animals to the hawk god Horus, the patron of all future kings of Egypt. Designed to evoke the silhouette of a crouching animal with horns and a tail, the temple was lavishly appointed with colored mats and pillars, perhaps made from cedars imported from Lebanon. The prototype of all the great temple complexes to come, it dominated the landscape of Hierakonpolis. But for now, the city of the Hawk had a rival, Bhutto, the capital of Lower Egypt. Situated north of modern Cairo in the Nile Delta, today all that remains of Bhutto is a huge amount of earth and debris and these stones and statues, which are dated 2,000 years later. But in this trench, archaeologists have uncovered the fragments of hundreds of clay pots dating back to the same period as Hierakonpolis, 3,500 BC and earlier. Dina Faltings of the German Archaeological Institute is in charge of the excavation and an expert in the study of ancient pottery. By reassembling the fragments and comparing them to pottery from Hierakonpolis, she's made a surprising discovery. Bhutto in early times was the home of a very different culture. The pots from Bhutto are less sophisticated than those from Upper Egypt. You have here a lump of clay on the bottom, and then they put in some upright slabs, and they, they just squeeze this together and burnish the surface to close it. In contrast to that, we have some imports from Upper Egypt, like this pot. It's a very little, elegant form. The quality is, you know, the, you can hear it. It's much tighter, and um, from uh, much better technology, they had better kilns in Upper Egypt. And obviously, the lower Egyptian people who made this kind of pots uh, realized that too, so they tried to imitate these pots. But uh, with their lower Egyptian technique and skill, which is not very high, so they didn't do a very good job. Dina Faltings' work at Bhutto reveals that by 3200 BC, the superior culture of Upper Egypt had swept through Lower Egypt, and the two kingdoms became one.
But was the transformation peaceful? Or was it bloody? The union of the two kingdoms along the Nile was a milestone in Egyptian civilization. But how it came about was a nagging question. All archaeologists had to go on was a single object found at Hierakonpolis in 1898. This exquisite ceremonial pallet made of slate dates back to around 3100 BC. It was dedicated by a king of Upper Egypt called Nama, who some believe was the legendary King Mene, Egypt's first pharaoh. On one side, Nama, wearing a bulbous crown, is about to strike down a prisoner in the presence of Horus, the hawk god of Hierakonpolis. On the other side of the pallet, Nama, wearing a crown with a curled tongue, appears in a procession moving towards two rows of decapitated prisoners. The lions, their long necks intertwined, symbolize unification. The key to understanding Nama's palette is in the crowns. In Upper Egypt, the king donned a white crown with a bulbous tip. In Lower Egypt, a red crown with a long protruding tongue. Together they form a double crown, signifying that Pharaoh had become the lord of the two lands. For the next 3,000 years after unification, the image of the king wearing a double crown would appear on statues and temples throughout Egypt to reinforce his dominion over all the land. Nama's palette seemed to confirm that unification occurred after a bloody conquest. But for a century it remained the only evidence, until a tiny object turned up at Egypt's oldest royal graveyard, Abydos. Believed to be the final resting place of Osiris, the god of the dead, the ground is strewn with broken pots, the shattered remains of offerings to one of Egypt's most important gods. Long before the pharaohs carved their tombs in the Valley of the Kings or built the pyramids, Egypt's first rulers were buried here in large brick-lined graves. Extensively explored around the turn of the century, Abydos was thought to have yielded up all of its secrets until 1977 when German archaeologist Günther Dreyer reopened the site. Since then, he and his team have reinvestigated the tombs of several early kings, including that of King Nama. Ah, Aiwa. Aiwa, Dreyer is excited about the discovery of an ivory label. Labels like this were originally attached to jars of oil. Small as it is, it contained a big surprise. It seems to depict the event on Nama's pallet. This is an ivory label of King Nama found near his tomb. Such labels served to indicate the date of shipments of oil. 
At that time, dates were indicated by names of years, and these names were chosen after the most important events of that year. In this case, it's a victory of uh, King Narmer over the Delta people. And obviously, it's the same event as depicted on the famous Narmer palette. From this, we may conclude that the Narmer palette indeed refers to a historical event which took place in a certain year. But the label is only one piece of the puzzle. Another discovery at Abydos suggests that the process of unification had begun long before Nama. Under these mounds of rubble, Dreyer found the tombs of kings from a previously unknown dynasty, which Egyptologists now call Dynasty Zero. In the tombs were more labels, even more astonishing than the first. Here, etched in ivory, was clear-cut proof the Egyptians had developed a fully evolved system of writing, not only earlier than previously thought, but earlier than the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, who are credited with being the first to produce a written language. The earliest Sumerian writing, seen here, was an accounting system made up of simple pictures and numbers. Egyptian writing already contained sound signs like modern alphabets. The hieroglyphs on these labels all represent sounds. The snake stands for the sound J. Along with two triangles, it spells out the word Ju, which means mountain. The symbols read the mountains of darkness referring to the west where the sun sets. The hieroglyphs on other labels indicate the king was already collecting taxes from both upper and lower Egypt. A sure sign unification had already taken place. To consolidate the kingdom, a new capital was built exactly where Upper and Lower Egypt meet. Founded by King Mene, who Egyptologists believe is the historical King Nama, Memphis was destined to be the greatest city in the land. For 3,000 years, the pharaohs would rule Egypt from Memphis. Yet today, all that's left are ruins, but none dating back to the time of King Nama. Egyptologists have long assumed that the ancient capital was always located here. But David Jeffries of the Egypt Exploration Society thinks Memphis was somewhere else and has spent nine years trying to find it. Using a simple manual drill, he has taken a series of core samples from fields two miles west of the ruins. The cores uncovered a substantial layer of artifacts ten feet below the surface. Typically, what we expect to find uh, in this area, just a, a few meters down from the position that we've reached at the moment, is pottery in the lowest level, the lowest silt level, pottery that represents the period around 3000 BC, period around 3000 BC of the earliest kings of unified Egypt, and which represent the foundation of the, the national capital in this area. What would cause the nation's first capital, a grand city of palaces and temples, homes and administrative buildings, to pick up and move? Two great natural forces, the desert and the Nile. We're standing here on the very edge of the Western Desert, looking over the Nile Valley towards the cliffs on the east side. 
the valley is only seven kilometers wide here. It's as narrow as it is anywhere in the, this northern part of the Nile Valley. And what we believe we've established, we're looking down at the area where we've been doing these drill cores, what we believe we've established is that the river flowed very close to this desert edge and that the city actually stood uh, along it, uh, directly below where we are, and that as sand swept in from the western desert and as the river at the same time moved eastwards, that the city followed the movement of the river to where the recognized ruin field is today, about three kilometers across the valley. The chaos of the shifting Nile on one side and the encroaching desert on the other haunted the Egyptians throughout their history. To overcome the ever-present threat of danger, they would put their faith in one man and the power of the gods. To protect themselves from disaster, the Egyptians vested their king with absolute power and worshipped him as a god. Only a god could talk to gods, and only a god could avert chaos. To preserve order, called Mart, personified as a seated goddess with a feather on her head, the pharaoh undertook daily rituals. To appease the gods, he built elaborate temples and furnished them with food, drink, and other offerings. Chaos came in many forms. It could manifest itself as a violent storm, sand blowing off the desert, or a foreign enemy. Images of the pharaohs as triumphant warriors are repeated again and again throughout Egyptian history. This one of Ramesses II appears on a temple constructed nearly 2,000 years after Nama conquered Lower Egypt. Ramesses probably never led an army into battle. The image is more symbolic than real. A message to all who saw it that the king fulfilled his sacred duty to maintain Mart, the divine order. More likely, the pharaohs supervised their military campaigns from afar. In 2280 BC, a senior court official named Weni ordered the details of his extraordinary career carved on the walls of his tomb. Weni relates how his pharaoh, King Pepe, dealt with the tribe of marauding nomads. When his majesty took action against those who dwell in the deserts of the east, he raised an army of many tens of thousands from all over Upper Egypt. There were noblemen, seal bearers, chieftains, and mayors. I was the one who commanded them. This army returned in safety. It had ravaged the sand dwellers' land. It had sacked its strongholds. It had thrown fire in all its mansions. His Majesty praised me for it beyond anything. Awesome power and destructive force, chaos could also erupt out of nowhere. Not far from the site of ancient Memphis, in a stone quarry at Helwan, 20 miles south of Cairo, is the world's oldest dam. Although it's hard to envision after 4,000 years, 
This massive pile of stone was part of a huge engineering project designed to control flash floods. Fascinated by early Egyptian technology, Günther Dreyer made a detailed study of the dam. He calculates it took 500 men 10 years to build it, hauling into place some 184,000 tons of stone. By any standards, the dam was an extraordinary attempt to thwart chaos. Unfortunately, it didn't work. The dam spanned the wadi from over there to there and had a length of about 330 feet and a height of 42 feet. It was rather solidly built in a cross section. It would look like that. At the base, a length of 300 feet. On top, about 150 feet. It consisted of three parts. In the middle, a loose filling of sand, and on both sides, a package of rough stones covered by a casing of dressed limestone blocks. Unfortunately, the dam was overflowed before it was finished. The water came over here and destroyed the unfinished part. And then, within a few minutes, huge amounts of water ran down the wadi and uh, destroyed all installations downwards. And so, the work of about 10 years and 500 workmen was just in vain. For the Egyptians who built it, the disaster was a tragic reminder of how destructive the forces of nature could be and of the need for constant vigilance. It was the Egyptians' unique vision of the cosmos, shaped by their environment, that sustained the world's most enduring civilization. At the center of it all was the king. With skills forged by his ancestors in the desert and honed along the banks of the ever-changing Nile, he maintained the balance of the universe with justice and piety. He fought the unrelenting onslaught of nature, social upheaval, even the supernatural. But in the end, there was one final, immutable battle with chaos that no one could escape. Although the king was a god, he was also a man. He was going to die. To avoid calamity, he ordered the Egyptians to begin hauling large stones to the desert's edge. Slowly, a new kind of monument arose that would come to symbolize the king's ultimate triumph. The triumph of eternal life. The age of the pyramid builders had begun. The year is 2350 BC. The funeral of a pharaoh named Unas. But this is not a day of mourning, it's a celebration. <laughs> For 3,000 years, the Egyptians clung to a cherished belief in the resurrection of the human spirit.
Today, the soul of the Pharaoh is being reborn. But the journey into the afterlife is not without its obstacles. These magic spells will guarantee a safe passage. The Pharaoh's quest for eternity would inspire the most colossal monuments ever built in antiquity. The Pyramids of Giza, near modern Cairo, are the world's most enduring testament to time. The oldest and the largest is the Great Pyramid. For over 4,000 years, it was the tallest man-made structure on Earth. Built of limestone, it's estimated that over three million blocks were quarried and hoisted into place, some weighing up to 15 tons apiece. The sheer wonder and perfection of the pyramids led Western travelers to speculate on who really built them and why. No mortal, and certainly no ancient Egyptian, could raise such immense stones. Was it the creator himself to conceal his divine plan for the universe? Or was it the fabled civilization of Atlantis to house their ancient wisdom? Perhaps visitors from outer space? But what self-proclaimed experts and mystics failed to observe was that the pyramids at Giza were not isolated phenomena. From Cairo to Aswan, 650 miles south along the Nile Valley, scores of pyramids dot the landscape. Most the final resting place of the pharaohs and their queens and most inexorably linked to the search for immortality. In ancient Egypt, the concept of the pyramid had its origins at the dawn of time. In the beginning, there was darkness and a formless ocean of chaos. Out of it arose a mound on this mound appeared the sun god, Ra, the embodiment of all life and energy, all light and warmth. Ra crossed the sky. Then at sunset, he plunged back into the chaotic abyss, only to be reborn the next morning at sunrise. The Egyptians hoped that by uniting their spirits with the sun god, they too could be swept into the cycle of eternal life. The pyramid was the vehicle to immortality, the resurrection machine. Seen as the mound of creation, it was part of an elaborate process conceived to assist the pharaoh on his journey to the afterlife. 
but no two pyramids were alike. Written on the walls of King Unis' tomb is a virtual guide to immortality. Called the Pyramid Texts, it's filled with arcane formulas and spells. One to rid the Pharaoh of all wrongdoings, a soul full of sin can't go to heaven. One to protect him from scorpions and snakes he might encounter along the way. One to announce his arrival to the sun god, Ra. Unis' tomb presents an extraordinary vision of the afterlife. A self-contained resurrection machine, it was born out of the soil and psyche of the Egyptian people. But until now, the true story of the pyramids would remain as obscure as those who built them. Towering over an ancient cemetery at Saqqara, some 10 miles south of Cairo, is Egypt's first pyramid. Called the Step Pyramid, it's also the first tall structure ever built in stone. Dedicated to the resurrection of King Djoser in 2610 BC, the Step Pyramid was something new. Before, the Egyptians had built their monuments of mud brick and wood. But here, not just a pyramid, but an entire complex of chapels and courtyards had been rendered for eternity in imperishable stone. The mastermind behind Joseph's complex was the king's minister and architect, Imhotep. A scholar and self-made man, his achievement earned him the title of vizier, the highest official in the land. Later, the Egyptians would even worship him as a saint. But recently, a new discovery far south of Saqqara, at the Royal Cemetery at Abydos, has raised the specter of who the true genius behind the resurrection machine really was. Here, 500 years before the arrival of the pyramid, the first kings of Egypt were buried under low rectangular mounds of sand and gravel. Since 1995, Günther Dreyer of the German Archaeological Institute and his team have been excavating the tomb of King Kasakemui, who ruled Egypt in 2680 BC. The largest royal tomb at Abydos, it was filled with underground chambers fit for a king. The tomb is uh, built in sun-dried mud bricks. It has about 65 chambers, and its whole length is about 200 feet. The chambers were, were covered by means of uh, wooden beams uh, and uh, matwork and above layers of mud brick. The large tomb pit was filled uh, with sand, and above desert level, there was a large mound, massive mound of sand and rubble. The mound, called by Egyptologists a mastaba, echoed the primordial mound of creation, the symbol of rejuvenation. A 
half a mile away on the edge of the desert, Kasakimbui also built a massive rectangular enclosure. Over 35 feet high and nearly 400 feet long, it's one of the oldest standing structures in the world made of brick. For decades, scientists thought it was a military fort. Locals thought it was the storehouse of Joseph, who predicted seven fat years and seven lean in the Bible. But they now know it was the Pharaoh's palace of eternity. For archaeologist David O'Connor of New York's Institute of Fine Art, it's also a marvel of ancient engineering. Although this uh, huge enclosure was built almost 5,000 years ago, it was built in a very, on a very massive scale and very, very soundly, so an extraordinary amount of it has still survived to today. And as a result, we're really able to reconstruct what it originally would have looked like. For example, every, every external face had this uh, series of recessed panels in it with a buttress and a recess and then another panel. Uh, these were plastered heavily with uh, mud plaster uh, and then painted white uh, so that instead of uh, simply great blank white walls rising about 30 or 40 feet high, uh, you had uh, walls across the faces of which there was a ever-changing pattern of light and shade throughout the day as the sun moved around the monument. The walls are a replica of those surrounding the king's actual palace and courtyard. The panels, an emblem of power. In life, the courtyard was a stage for the pageantry and ceremony of ancient Egypt. In death, a testament to faith in continuity. Kasakimui's enclosure was the largest of several built at Abydos. But the king had more ambitious plans. In search of the perfect resurrection machine, he would become the first great builder in Egyptian history. In the shadow of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara, Ian Matheson of the National Museum of Scotland is investigating a mystery that has puzzled archaeologists for years. Using a remote sensing device developed for oil exploration, he's investigating a landmark known as Gizr el Mudir, which means the enclosure of the boss. And that's us over the other side of the wall now. 39.2. In the 1940s, an aerial photograph revealed the outline of an immense stone structure almost a half a mile long and nearly a quarter mile wide. On the surface, only a few sections of the wall remain. This is the inside of the wall on the north wall, and it stretches from this here over to the horizon, where you can see about 15 meters wide at this point here, made of local limestone. Then the wall continues to the end, and the whole width of the uh, enclosure is about 350 meters from this side across to the other, and about 650 meters over the sight line you can see just now. The south wall is over the horizon. The actual size of the enclosure is almost twice the size of the Zosa pyramid enclosure. It is an amazing construction because if you look at the size of it, is, it must have been the largest stone construction that anyone could put up at that time in history, which is about four and a half thousand years ago. Pottery found at the site indicates the enclosure may predate King Joseph's by 25 years, making it the oldest monumental building ever erected entirely of stone. If so, who built it? Only King Kasakimui had the skill to make a more permanent bid for immortality. 
but no one could prove it until Günther Dreyer made an exciting new discovery at Abydos. During our excavation, we found lots of seal impressions with inscriptions. And astonishingly, among them were several ones with the name of King Djoser. And from this we may conclude that Djoser buried Kaza Himui and must have been his immediate successor. This is quite important for the understanding of the development of the royal tomb. The revelation that Joseph succeeded Kasakemui filled in a long-standing gap in Egyptian history. Egyptologists knew that Joseph was Kasakemui's stepson, but other contenders were vying for the throne. The seals not only confirmed the succession, now, for the first time, archaeologists could trace the evolution of the pyramid from its infancy. Borrowing on his father's grand scheme for the afterlife, King Djoser then took it one step further. When Djoser built his tomb, he decided to bring the two elements, tomb and large enclosure, together. But what happened? He built his tomb shaft, the chamber, and above the mound, the initial masnaba. And then the enclosure wall was built around it. But now the important mound was no longer visible. To solve this problem, they built several smaller masnabas on top of the first one. And they were quite visible over the enclosure wall. And so we have a step pyramid there. A staircase to heaven is laid for him that he may ascend it to the sky, says one of the oldest fragments of Egyptian writing. The journey from a simple dirt mound to the world's first pyramid sprang from a powerful vision of the hereafter, one that would inexorably alter the landscape of Egypt. Although the next few attempts at pyramid building failed, the monument at Saqqara would inspire another dreamer to reach for the stars. This odd-looking ruin near the village of Medum, some 50 miles south of Cairo, marked the beginning of a new chapter in the evolution of pyramids. The only full-size step pyramid completed after King Joseph's, it's also the last one like it ever built. Called the False Pyramid in Arabic, it eventually collapsed as the result of ancient stone robbing. but not before the remarkable man behind it had already decided to try something different. Snefru was revered as a benevolent and good-humored king, a true visionary, he would become Egypt's greatest pyramid builder. For him, Medum was just the beginning. Moving north to Dashur, Snefru built two more monuments. What is now known as the Bent Pyramid would have surpassed the Great Pyramid of Giza if the builders had kept to their plans. But halfway through construction, it began to crack.
Rainer Stadelmann of the German Archaeological Institute is an expert on King Snefru's projects. Allowed unprecedented access to the pyramid, he now knows exactly what went wrong. This is a major crack. Many of these cracks happened during the construction of the pyramid because it was built on a weak ground. The king and his architects were very worried and unhappy about this. Uh, they even tried to reduce uh, the angle of the pyramid, creating so the appearance of the bent pyramid. But finally, nothing could be done. The pyramid had to be abandoned. The pyramid had been erected on a sandy plain without a solid foundation. Eventually, it began to subside. To stabilize it, the builders changed the slope from 54 to 43 degrees, hoping to reduce its weight. But it was too late. Two miles away, Snefru launched his third and final pyramid. Quick to learn from their mistakes, the king's architects laid a foundation of limestone to prevent subsidence and settled on an angle of 43 degrees, the same as the top of the bent pyramid. Called the red pyramid for the glowing color of the local limestone, it's the first true geometric pyramid and Egypt's fourth tallest. Snefru could now ascend to heaven on a ramp that gleamed like the rays of the sun. The pyramid is entered by a long descending passageway three feet square. At the bottom are three interconnected chambers, each over 40 feet high and each with a distinctive corbel ceiling. Designed to support the weight of the pyramid above, they resemble a step pyramid in reverse. Pyramid within a pyramid not only reinforced the structure, the Egyptians believed it doubled the king's chances for resurrection. With this sequence of three large and high rooms, uh, King Snofru finally had achieved a burial place, an eternal residence he could be happy and content with. These rooms are constructed of large limestone blocks. Uh, the roof in layers of limestone blocks, everyone protruding about 15 centimeters. With this ingenious construction, uh, the mass of the pyramid resting on it could be supported. There are about two, more than two million tons of stone on these rooms but there's no crack and no danger in it. The roof represents religiously also the sky uh, resting over the wooden sarcophagus in which King Snofru rested for eternity. One of Reiner Stadelmann's most important discoveries at Dashur would finally answer two age-old questions. Who actually built the pyramids and how long did it take? 
When we started excavation here, we found a part of the casing still preserved. Other blocks had been fallen. On the reverse of these blocks, we found the name of the working gangs who constructed the pyramid. For example, the green one in Egyptian, Wachet, the name of the king, King Snofru, and dates. With these dates, we could uh, realize that after two years, already six layers of the pyramid have been constructed. Two years later, uh, about 15 meters uh, of the pyramid has been completed. And from another date, we learn that it took about 17 years to construct the whole pyramid. To build his pyramids, Snefru would quarry more stone and harness more manpower than any other pharaoh during the Old Kingdom. But his successor would concentrate his energy on one, the greatest resurrection machine of them all. Rising from the Giza Plateau is the ultimate expression of the quest for eternity. Built for Snefru's successors, Khufu, Kafra and Benkaura, they are virtually man-made mountains. The superhuman scale of the Great Pyramid alone earned Khufu the reputation of a cruel tyrant. It contained enough stone to build a wall three feet high around the whole of France, according to Napoleon, who marveled at it in 1798. Time has been kinder to the pyramid of King Khafra. Only two feet smaller than the Great Pyramid, it's better preserved. The original limestone facing still decorates the summit. It also retains the remnants of several structures that were an integral part of the resurrection machine. At the base of the pyramid was a mortuary temple supplied with daily offerings of food and drink in the belief that even a dead king needed sustenance. From there, a covered causeway almost a third of a mile long led to a valley temple, a monumental portal linking the desert plateau to the life-giving and purifying waters of the Nile. But Kafra added something new to the traditional pyramid complex. The Sphinx one of Egypt's most haunting images. A sprawling lion with the head of a man, it reaches across time to proclaim the king, master of the world. On a journey to Egypt in 450 BC, the Greek historian Herodotus was told the pyramids were built by slaves. But all evidence of their existence seemed to vanish without a trace until American archaeologist Mark Lehner began mapping the Giza Plateau. Since then, he's uncovered proof that far from a labor camp, Giza was once a thriving community of workers the size of a small city dedicated to serving the kings. South of the pyramids, a stone wall separates the tombs and temples of Giza from 40 acres of empty desert. It was here that Lena and his team began their excavations. This large stone wall is called the Wall of the Crow in Arabic, and it's played a major part in our thinking about where we're excavating. Our site is just to the south. Anywhere else in the world, and this would be a national treasure, actually it's been somewhat ignored here at Giza because it's dwarfed by the pyramids and the Sphinx. 
it's much bigger than you think. It actually, our trenches up against the wall shows that it is some 10 meters, 30 feet tall. And this gateway behind me, therefore, is about 21 feet tall, maybe one of the largest gates in the ancient world. In 1991, they dug a trench, exposing thousands of pieces of pottery from the time of the pyramids. The pottery came from two rooms he believes were ancient bakeries. Several pots contained what looked like grain. To find out, he turned it over to archaeobotanists like Mary Ann Murray. In a flotation tank, the dirt falls to the bottom. What's left is vegetation. Later analysis confirmed it was wheat, possibly used for baking bread. The bakeries were attached to the back of a much larger mud brick building enclosed by a five foot thick wall. Inside were curious low benches and troughs, beautifully paved with desert clay. Lena and his team were baffled until they took a closer look at the dirt on the floor. Scraping that back, sometimes with Swiss army knives, we found these fibrous deposits, very fragile, that turned out to be the gills, fins, cranial parts, vertebrae of fish. Looking at some of the dirt filling the troughs under a microscope, it was filled with fish bones scattered throughout. So we seem to have inside the enclosure of the mud brick building a facility for processing fish. It soon became evident that Lena and his team had stumbled upon the kitchens that fed the pyramid builders. A short distance away, an ancient cemetery bears witness to the legions of craftsmen and laborers who stayed on to serve the dead kings. Built of stone left over from the pyramids, some are miniature mastabas with tiny courtyards and false doors bearing inscriptions of the owner's name. Others are simple graves topped with domes, a crude reflection of a pyramid. But all are resurrection machines. Zahi Hawass, director of the Giza pyramids, has been excavating the ancient cemetery of the workmen. From the engraved walls of one of the more interesting tombs, we can learn a little bit more about the lives of these once unknown people. This man, his name is Nefertith. He married to two wives, and I believe it's very rare they lived with him in the same time. He had something like 11 children. But what's interesting, that his wife, his main wife, had a title in her graphic called Yen At. She was doing weaving. And underneath the false door, we have a very interesting scenes that never occurred in any tomb before. This man is making wine, and this man is making beer. Even in the offering table here, they're talking about four types of wine and five types of beer. Because the common diet for a workman and a king in ancient Egypt were drinking beer and eating bread. I really believe that this man, Nefertith, once was in charge of the bakery located to the east uh, of the tombs of the workmen. So far, some 600 tombs have been discovered. It now appears that the Wall of the Crows was the barrier that separated the hallowed ground of the pyramids from the mundane world of those who built them. It's estimated 20,000 Egyptians were drafted to erect just one pyramid at Giza. In the years to come, nothing quite like them would ever be seen again. Time would not be so kind to Egypt's next dynasty of kings. These ruined tombs are called the Forgotten Pyramids. Located not far from south of Giza at a site called Abusir, they are smaller than their colossal predecessors and in poor condition. 
their limestone casings stripped in Roman times. In 1893, local farmers digging among some pyramids stumbled upon over 300 fragments of papyrus. Because they were difficult to read, the fragments were dispersed and forgotten. Then, in 1976, one caught the attention of archaeologist Miroslav Werner, director of the Czech mission exploring Abusir. It mentioned the mortuary temple of a little-known king named Raneferev, whose tomb had never been found. Werner suspected it lay under tons of sand near an unfinished pyramid. Because the pyramid was incomplete, early archaeologists assumed it had never been used, but they were wrong. At its base, Werner found a once fully operational mortuary temple, complete with the largest cache of 5th dynasty sculpture in existence including a rare painted limestone statue of the king, his head shielded by his protector, the falcon god Horus. The pyramid complex was excavated in several uh, previous seasons, and we are at present digging in the core of the pyramid, uh, where we succeeded in discovering the entrance to the funerary apartment of Franefere. We can expect, on the basis of what we have already found here in this area, in uh, remains of the burial equipment of the king, possibly also fragments of his red granite sarcophagus, and who knows, maybe even remains of his mummy. If Raneferev's mummy is found, this once forgotten king will reign as the only old kingdom pharaoh to survive intact in his tomb. Raneferev probably died in his twenties before his pyramid was finished. But the practical business of resurrection took place in the mortuary temple. Its importance was confirmed by Werner's next and most significant discovery an archive of rare documents describing the activities of the king's cult. From the papyri found in this place, we have learned that the mortuary temple of Raneferev was a thriving religious center for at least 200 years after the king's death. About 200 priests, divided in five shifts, maintained the cult of the dead king by day and by night. By day they brought daily offerings consisting of bread, beer, meat, vegetables, fruit, etc. By night, some priests watched from the temple terrace the stars and kept the records. The records from Abusir reveal a bureaucracy obsessed with detail. Meticulous inventories were kept of furnishings and cult objects, along with stockpiles and deliveries of food, and revenues collected from the king's estates. Duty rosters of priests charged with performing the daily rituals. Assignments included reviving the king's spirit, clothing his statue, and laying out sumptuous meals on the altars. What the king didn't eat, the priests did. According to one document, 130 bulls were slaughtered during one 10-day festival, all to honor a short-lived king. Ronefereff's cult flourished for 200 years before it was finally abandoned and his tomb forgotten. Centuries later, the great resurrection machines would vanish from the Egyptian landscape, only to reappear in a very different form.
In 1500 BC, the pharaoh Tutmosi I instructed his architect named Ineni to build him a tomb. On the west bank of the Nile, opposite Thebes, Egypt's most important religious center, he found the perfect spot, an isolated canyon dominated by a huge pyramid-shaped mountain called the Kurun. Here, deep in the rock, Ineni carved out his tomb. Certain the body of his pharaoh would be secure, he left a touching inscription on the walls of his own tomb a few miles away. It reads, I built the tomb of my majesty, no one seeing, no one hearing. Nearly 30 pharaohs would eventually be buried in what is now known as the Valley of the Kings. Immortality was assured by a stunning array of texts decorating the walls. While the Egyptians went underground, the pyramid would make a dramatic reappearance in another ancient but little known kingdom. Hidden away in Nubia, in modern-day Sudan, is one of history's best-kept secrets. These pyramids are the relics of a once powerful civilization known as the Kingdom of Kush. The story of why they were built begins around 1400 BC. For centuries, Egypt had coveted the wealth of Nubia. The Kushites controlled vast resources of gold and other minerals. They also dominated the principal trade routes to the heart of Africa. In the reign of Tutmosi III, Egypt finally conquered Nubia, and the Kingdom of Kush became part of Egypt. 700 years later, the Kushite rulers in turn laid claim to Egypt's throne. Their claim centered around a flat-topped mountain in Nubia called Jebel Bakal. The mountain fascinated the Egyptians. On its western flank, the shape of a strange pinnacle led them to believe it was sacred. American archaeologist Tim Kendall of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts has spent years unraveling the secrets of Jebel Bakal. When the Egyptians came here, they saw in this strange rock formation uh, the image of, of a very familiar symbol to them, a, a rearing cobra, which was uh, called a uraeus, the symbol of kingship, which the kings wore on their crown. The cobra form seems to be wearing the white crown of the south, which symbolized kingship over the south. The symbolism of the cobra and the white crown marked the presence at Jebel Barkal of Amun-Ra, Egypt's most important god, whose main home was in the temple of Karnak at Thebes. A form of Amun-Ra with a ram's head was believed to live inside the rock. His presence conferred kingship over all the Nile Valley, including Nubia. To honor Amun-Ra, the Kushite kings built a temple within the rock and decorated one wall with a depiction of the sacred mountain and the all-powerful god. In this little temple built by Taharqa, the greatest of the Kushite rulers of Egypt, uh, we actually have a representation of Jebel Barkal. And here you see the, the cliff. The mountain's actually painted red-brown. And within the mountain sits the god, who's shown ram-headed. The Nubian Amun was always ram-headed. And here he's actually called Amun, 
Lord of the thrones of the two lands, who is in the pure mountain, which is the name of Jebel Barkal. And here you see the great uh, pinnacle represented as a rearing cobra, or a uraeus, uh, with a sun disk on its head. When you see the mountain from the west side, um, it, the pinnacle actually looks like this. It has a, an orb on its top, and if you're standing there shortly after sunrise, the sun appears to come right out of the, the pinnacle and perch right on the top. By 750 BC, Kushite rulers were considered legitimate pharaohs. Recognized as Egypt's 25th dynasty, five kings reigned for half a century, during which they donned Egyptian costumes and titles. They adopted Egyptian art and architecture and inaugurated a new era of pyramid building that would last for a thousand years and produce some 200 pyramids more than in all of Egypt. But Kushite pyramids had a style all their own. They are visibly smaller and steeper in angle than Egyptian pyramids, and their tops are flat. Their offering chapels looked like miniature temples. But the biggest difference was how they were built. Egyptian kings constructed their own and were often buried inside them. When the Kushite kings died, they were buried underground and their pyramids erected over them. One of the most important pyramid fields is at Meroe. All the burial chambers were looted in antiquity, except for one the tomb of a queen named Amanashakete. Here, in the last century, an Italian adventurer, Giuseppe Ferlini, discovered a fabulous cache of gold jewelry. The find triggered a wave of treasure hunting, during which the pyramids were systematically vandalized and some almost totally destroyed. The last pyramid ever built on the African continent was erected four centuries after the birth of Christ. Today, it's a heap of rubble. Still, the landscape of Meroe is a vivid reminder of a tradition that survived for 3,000 years and gave the world its most enduring symbol of the ancient past. In 1327 BC, ancient Egypt is in mourning. In the Valley of the Kings, craftsmen scurry to prepare a makeshift tomb. 
barely 19 years old, the pharaoh Tutankhamun is dead. His tomb is borrowed. Only four small rooms, it's tiny by royal standards. But its contents are fit for a king. A throne bearing a portrait of the young king and his wife is sheathed in gold. While his coffin, the innermost one of three, is cast in solid gold and weighs over a ton. The mask that covered the face of his mummy is considered one of the most beautiful works of art ever crafted in the precious metal. The treasures of Tutankhamun's tomb, the only one discovered intact in the Valley of the Kings, are only a glimmer of what ancient Egypt must have been like during its fabulous Age of Gold. For over 400 years, Egypt's pharaohs were laid to rest in the Valley of the Kings. Their tombs were carved out of solid rock, but the burial chamber was called the House of Gold. Because of its warm glow and indestructibility, gold was thought to be the flesh of the sun god Ra and contained supernatural powers. The pharaoh was the offspring of the sun, a living god. By lavishing him with gold, the flesh of the gods, the Egyptians believed the pharaoh was assured an eternal life. But it was not to be. Filled with treasure beyond the imagination, most of their tombs would be opened in antiquity and their mummies removed. Lying in state in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo are the remains of some of Egypt's most powerful pharaohs. Tutmose I, Tutmose II, Tutmose IV, Seti I, and Ramesses the Great. But Tutankhamun's tiny tomb, along with his name, was lost and virtually forgotten. When the tomb was finally uncovered in 1922, the most stunning archaeological find of all time made Tutankhamun the most famous name in Egyptian history. His treasures bore witness to the astonishing riches and power of Egyptian civilization during the Age of Gold. Envied for its wealth, Egypt was blessed with a seemingly inexhaustible supply of gold, mined from the deserts east of the Nile Valley and especially from Nubia, now the Sudan. It was virtually common as dust. I cast statues of the gods in gold and electrum, decorated with lapis lazuli and all fine stones, proclaims one of Tutankhamun's inscriptions. I built new ships to ply the waters and covered them with gold so that they illuminated the Nile. Tutankhamun was one of 14 kings that comprised Egypt's 18th dynasty. In 1550 BC, its founder, Ahmose I, inaugurated the new kingdom and launched the greatest empire the world had ever seen.
At its height, Egypt's sphere of influence would stretch as far north as Syria and as far south as the central Sudan. But before Amorza's reign, there was no empire. For a hundred years, Egypt had been ruled by foreigners. Originally from Canaan, these foreigners, known as the Huxos, had established a power base in the Nile Delta, giving them a stranglehold on the lucrative Mediterranean trade routes. The Huxos had an advantage better military technology. A superior form of battle axe was designed for piercing. Their bows, a composite made of wood, sinew and horn, sent arrows streaming over longer distances. But their most potent weapon was something new, mobility. With a horse-drawn chariot, the Huxos could move fast and wield their arms with deadly force. All Egypt paid obeisance to the foreigners, but with increasing reluctance. In Thebes, a family of local rulers, styling themselves as the true kings of Egypt, eventually rebelled. One of them, King Sekenenre Ta, paid the ultimate price. Dr. Mohamed Saleh, the director of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, has grisly proof. This is the mummy of Sekhnen Ra'ata, who died in the battlefield against the Hyksos. And uh, as we unwrapped his body, we found so many mutilations and cuts. And you can see that he died in agony and the face had, had cuts which uh, would not have been done except only by uh, weapons uh, brought by the Hyksos to Egypt for the first time. One of the weapons that did the damage was the battle axe distinctive to the Hyksos, its long narrow blade perfectly suited to piercing bone. Humiliated by the presence of foreign rulers on Egyptian soil, Sekenenre Ta had led the first open revolt against the Huxos. After his death, his son, Kamose, took up the fight. Carved on a stela, a commemorative stone found in Thebes, is an account of the bitter hatred between Kamose and the king of the Huxos, Ipepi. As mighty Amun endures, I will not leave you alone, the Egyptian promises his enemy. I will not let you tread the fields without being upon you. O oh, wicked of heart, vile Asiatic, I shall drink the wine of your vineyard, lay waste your dwelling place, cut down your trees. The dwelling place of the Huxos was a mighty fortress in the Nile Delta called Avaris. From there they ruled Egypt for a hundred, a hundred years. Then, like the tomb of Tutankhamun, Avaris vanished without a trace. For thousands of years, the Nile River coursed through Egypt before branching out into a series of tributaries that form the rich flood plain of the Nile Delta.
Here, the Hooksaws built their capital. But for over a century, its exact location remained one of the great mysteries of modern archaeology. Covered over by millennia of silt, Avaris virtually disappeared until 1975, when a team of Austrian archaeologists, led by Manfred Bietak of the University of Vienna, began investigating a site known as Tel El Daba. Tel means mound, usually the site of an ancient settlement. Pottery recovered from hundreds of boreholes sunk into the Tel helped Bitak home in on Tel El Daba as the site of ancient Avaris. To the trained eye, Avaris is clearly not Egyptian. Its dwellings and temples are similar to those found in ancient Canaan and Syria. Among the contents of the graves, weapons and pottery of Hyksos type have been found. But in the 1990s, Bitak made what may be the most important find of them all, the remains of a palatial fortress. Surrounded by a giant wall, its most prominent feature was a heavily fortified citadel, strategically located on a vanished branch of the Nile. Bitak believes this was the dwelling place of the Hyksos king, Ipepi. Kamosa had threatened to attack Avaris and drive out the Hyksos. Now, as he was about to make good on his word, Ipepi hatched a clever plan. In what is now the northern Sudan lay the kingdom of Kush, its capital, the city of Kerma. About 1555 BC, a messenger left Avaris and headed south across the desert towards Kerma, bent on a secret mission. But his journey would be interrupted. In 1991, John and Deborah Darnell of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago were exploring the desert a short distance northwest of ancient Thebes when they stumbled upon an ancient caravan road worn smooth by centuries of use. led them to a hill they call Jebel Jauti. What makes this desert cliff so unusual are the inscriptions. It's covered with graffiti. Left by travelers pausing for a rest along the road, some are prayers to the gods, some commemorate special journeys and events. But most are simply names and titles. The 4,000-year-old Egyptian equivalent of Kilroy was here. Among them are some real works of art. This is probably one of the most lovely of the inscriptions we have here at Chaudi. It's um, a little royal falcon wearing a double crown. And what's wonderful about this particular inscription is you can really get a feeling for how the artist selected the area in which he was going to make the inscription. 
and there's this wonderful blush of salt coming out of the stone. And that little spot in the middle must have suggested the shape of the body of a falcon because he chose just the right area to accentuate his carving. Also, we had a very difficult time when we were trying to make the original copy doing it from a right-handed position. It was almost impossible to complete. But we had a left-hander with us, and she had no problem making the inscription copy. So we assume that the original artist was also a left-hander. The Darnells eventually uncovered a network of desert roads running north-south across the Niles Kenner Bend and linking with other routes to the great oases in the west and to Nubia in the south. Guarding the roads was a chain of lookout posts manned by desert policemen. Today what appears to be a pile of rubble was once a pair of towers some 30 feet in height. The towers would play a key role in the war against the Hooksos. These are guarding the caravan tracks that go to Jebel Chauti. And we know that this area is at the border of Thebes, the northern border of the Theban province. And these towers appear then to have been in use around the time of Kamosa to guard the caravan tracks here and to be used as bases for the roving desert policemen who would be guarding the narrow door of the desert, as the Egyptians called it, this back door to Thebes. For the Hooksos, the back door to Thebes was the road to disaster. Epepi had hoped to defeat Kamose by forging an alliance with the king of Kush and opening a second front on Egypt's southern border. But his plan was thwarted when his messenger was captured in the desert on his way to Kerma. Kamose died before the Hooksos were finally ousted. The task would fall to his brother, Amose the founder of the 18th dynasty. The first pharaoh to rule during the Age of Gold, Amose was bent on liberating Egypt. Determined to beat the enemy at his own game, Amose adopted some of the superior weapons of the Hooksos. Soon, horse-drawn chariots driven by Egyptians appeared on the battlefield. But the details of who exactly vanquished the Hooksos might have been lost in obscurity were it not for a remarkable set of inscriptions found near a tiny village called El Kab in Upper Egypt. In an unabashed display of vanity, a soldier in the Pharaoh's army, also named Amose, left his autobiography on the walls of his tomb. Vivian Davis, keeper of Egyptian antiquities at the British Museum, sees a man who not only rose from the ranks to become an admiral, but was highly decorated for his valor. The highest accolade that could be bestowed upon one as a soldier in ancient Egypt was to be awarded the gold of honor by the king. This man was awarded the gold of honor seven times. He must have been a military hero of his age. He's shown, in fact, wearing the gold of honor proudly here. These armlets made of solid gold. Amose began his illustrious career at the